Is it really just sensationalism that we point out that ancient history is absolutely replete with inaccuracies? And the fact that there is evidence all over the planet pointing to our conclusion that we are in fact from a civilization so ancient that it makes the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians look like modern cultures. It's not sensationalism and we condemn such accusations and we must point out that the true sensationalist are the ones who have spoon fed us their own interpretations of what they expect history to be. All we are doing here is presenting facts that should not be overlooked or ignored any longer. We all need to have access to this evidence as we weigh up the true meaning and timeline of ancient history. Wait till you hear this. In the ancient Colbrun text, the Great Sphinx is referred to as the Rachma, which is patiently waiting for the day of the destroyer. But what exactly does the word Rachma mean and how do we know it to be in reference to the Sphinx? Well, in ancient Egypt mythology, the father of the gods, sun god, and protector of mankind was Ra. So the term sun god is fairly self-explanatory, or is it? Emanuel Velikovsky, who was an author of several controversial books, reinterpreting ancient historical events, points out that in ancient times, the word sun was sometimes used to refer to a different planet altogether. A planet which exploded many thousands of years ago in a nova light burst of brilliant light and earned from Chaldean astronomers the name Alap Shamus, Star of the Sun. According to the Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, the Chaldeans called this planet Helios, while Babylonian astrologers knew it as Shemash and Ult Galu, the great sun of storms. In India, the planet was once called the sun's name, Archai, and in ancient Greece, it was Phionin, the shining one. The Zoroastrian Parsi Bandayash speaks of the star Tishtar, saying that for 30 days and nights, he was distinguished in brilliance, and in each form, he produced rain 10 days and nights. Every single drop of that rain became as big as a bowl and the water stood the height of a man over the whole of this earth. The Colbrun roughly echoes this measurement. When the tumult quieted and the waters became still, they stood no more than three cubits above the earth. The Mexican Codex says that the first world age, which ended when the earth was destroyed by a universal deluge called Atenoteyu, the son of water, was proceeded over by a body in the heavens called Siactyl. This planet known as Cronus of the ancient Greeks was called Saturn by the Romans and has been Saturn ever since. In other words, the Ra in the word Rachma could refer either to the father protector sun god Ra or the planet Saturn. Many names in the Colburn have become skewed over centuries of translation, but not Kima. In the Old Testament, it appears in Job 38. Can you bind the cluster of the Kima or loosen the cords of Kessel? And in Amos 5, 8, seek him who made the Kima and Kessel and turns the shadow of death into the morning and makes the day dark with night. Who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out of the surface of the Eretz. The Lord is his name. The third century Jewish astronomer Rabbi Bar Nachmani wrote, when the Holy One wants to bring a flood upon the world, he took two stars from Kimah and brought a flood. And the 11th century scholar Rashi Isaac ben Solomon wrote that a comet called Kimah caused the flood. Whatever Kimah was, it was a force to be reckoned with. The ancient Egyptians certainly thought so, for as the philologist E.A. Wallace Budge notes, they used the word Kimai, meaning destroyer, and to destroy or attack. Vilikovsky was convinced that the planet Saturn caused the Great Flood. In the beginning, uses a host of ancient Greek, Roman, and Sanskrit texts to support his theory, identifying Kima with what ancient texts called moist Saturn, Kessel, with hot Mars, and suggests that a supernova explosion by Saturn precipitated the flood. Apart from Saturn, there are other contenders for the role of planetary villain. In St. Jerome's 4th century Vulgate and in the King James Bible, 
Kimba is translated as the star cluster Pleiades, or Hades, or as the star Arcturus. Vilikovsky rejects these interpretations, pointing out that in rabbinical literature, the term Mazel Kamash used. Mazel means planet, and Saturn, he maintains, is the only planet that can be identified with Kimma. Whether or not Vilikovsky was correct in identifying Kimma with Saturn, the Cobra makes clear that the Great Flood which followed this planetary event was one of almost total destruction. It was preceded by days of brilliant supernova light. Two heavenly bodies fell from the sky. One of them belched forth fire and hot stones and a vile smoke. It covered the whole sky above and the meeting place of earth and heaven could no longer be seen. The stars in the heavens were loosened from their places, so they dashed about in confusion. There was a revolt on high, a new ruler appeared there and swept across the sky in majesty. This cosmic chaos turned day into night and triggered earthquakes, whirlwinds, thunder, lightning, and volcanic activity accompanied by a terrific noise in the heavens above, followed by great heat and bitter cold. Then the Earth was bombarded with water from two different directions from above the Earth's atmosphere and extraterrestrial torrents. The floodgates of heaven were opened, the pillars of heaven were broken and fell down to Earth. The sky vault was rent and broken, and from below in gigantic burst, the foundations of Earth were broken apart. The surrounding waters poured over the land and broke upon the mountains. Changes in the world's ancient calendar suggest this heavenly chaos caused a change in Earth's orbit. At some point in the ancient times, the Hindu Aryans, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Mexicans, the Incas, and the Chinese all amended their calendars from 360 to 365 and a half days. The writer Richard Mooney suggests in Colony Earth that an alteration in Earth's distance from the sun and its orbital position would account for the difference in the length of the year. If Earth had been jolted out of its previously held orbital position, the moon also would have been affected. The change would have affected the Earth-Moon system. Since the moon is a smaller body than Earth and the distances between them much smaller than between the Earth and the sun, the differences would have been even more noticeable in the case of the Earth-Moon system than in the case of the Earth-Sun system. Was this the kind of shift that the Sphinx early warning system might have picked up on its sensor? The Colbrin states that the Earth has been completely destroyed twice in human memory, once by fire and once partially by water. The destruction by water was, it says, the lesser destruction. So when Kima an eruption of heavenly bodies from either Saturn or a star cluster fell to Earth, it brought about the second worst disaster in our planet's history and spelt unimaginable terror for mankind. What is interesting here is how close Rakuma, father of Kima, is to the Sphinx later Arab name Abu Hal, father of Terra. Could Rakuma be an extremely ancient name for the Sphinx? If it was, then as human memory of the terrible event of the catastrophe dimmed over thousands of years, Rakuma might have become simply father of terror. Whatever the answer is, whatever the truth may be, we are certain the Sphinx is older than anything we have yet to come up with. It was built to last and as a warning system at Giza, an astronomical clock that we are as yet to fully understand. What do you guys think of this anyway? This is part three in our Sphinx mini-series, and if you've missed the first two episodes, then please go and check those out. These videos are based on decades of research from people like Graham Hancock. We will leave links below to these sources, guys, so please be sure to go and check that out and help spread the word. Part four to follow. We hope you are enjoying these videos. Comments below, and remember, the ways by which we arrive at knowledge are hardly less wonderful than the discovery of these things themselves. Also that by now it's a hundred years since Darwin achieved his victory over the book of Genesis. Now it is a little bit difficult to, uh, to go back and to say, well, the story is not exactly so.